Welcome to episode three of the Wildwood podcast. Today we have the Director General of the Wildwood Trust, Paul Whitfield. Fantastic, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, so yeah, we're just going to dive straight in with a couple of questions. Um, how did Wildwood begin? Well, it's, it's, it's a long and weird story, really. So on <laughs> this site here in Kent, there's been some sort of animal park since the 70s. Um, started out with just a very small thing with some wild boar and some red squirrels. Um, and it grew over the years, became a thing called Brambles, and then rebranded as Wildwood sort of you know, about 25 years ago. And then it was, it was Ken West, who was at the time working with um, Kent Wildlife Trust when we were doing the first beaver project in the UK, in Kent. Um, and those beavers for that project were quarantined here in the park. And he was here looking at it and thinking, actually, this could be a fantastic native species charity, which is what he'd always really wanted to set up. Mm -hmm. And so the charity was formed, we took over the park, and that was 22 years ago. And that was the wow. start of Wildwood Trust. And, and look how far it's come already. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And plenty more to go. But um, how did you get involved with, with Wildwood Trust? Like, what's your journey within, within this? So that's a really interesting story <laughs> as well. So um, I originally did a zoology degree. Mm -hmm. but realised I hated doing research and sort of dropped out of that whole world and retrained okay. and became a solicitor. Oh, wow, OK. And I was sitting in Maidstone working away as a solicitor, specialising in employment law, mm -hmm. when um, Ken and Peter, who was the CEO at the time, came to see me to get some legal advice about Wildwood. And that had a huge falling out with a guy who was running the park at the time called Derek Gow, who's now a very famous rewilder. <laughs> Um, and things had gone a bit bad, and he had left, and so my very first involvement was sending a letter to threaten to sue Derek Gow. <laughs> <laughs> Who's now a close friend of yours. Who's now a close <laughs> friend of mine, and we do lots and lots of projects and work oh, together. Um, but I thought it was a, a fantastic charity, and I came to the park, and they got me to cuddle a badger, and just saw the work they were doing, and I, I was really inspired. Um, and Ken then persuaded me to become a trustee, mm -hmm. And so I could work for free for the charity. <laughs> uh, and I was, I was a trustee for years and then became the chairman of trustees. Mm -hmm. And then about six years ago, the, you know, the organisation had expanded enormously. Mm. And I stepped down as a trustee, became executive chairman as a director. Mm -hmm. And sort of spent a year sort of putting the trust back on an even keel and really getting it directed forwards. And it worked really well. Mm. And so five years ago, I was appointed as director general running the charity and yeah haven't looked back since really fantastic i mean one of the things that mark said in in, in his episode um was just the kind of the um you know once you start working uh, within zoos and within um the wildlife industry you, you just kind of catch the bug yeah like he said he w didn't particularly know that he wanted to do this for 20 30 years but you just seem to once you start getting involved in things like wildwood trust like you just you just just carries on like yeah absolutely i mean what we're what we're doing now is is fantastic you know it's, it's inspirational work i'm really proud of it and it's you know it, it i'm very proud to be part of it mm. and what is the vision for wildwood trust and and how do you plan to achieve it as, as director general well we one of the first things i did once i was appointed is we completely relooked at our strategy and our mission and our vision for the future mm -hmm. We reformulated our mission into something very simple, which is protecting, conserving and rewilding native species. Mm -hmm. so that's all we do, British wildlife, getting it back in the wild. Fundamentally, yeah. that's what Wildwood is, is all about. Um, and one of our goals we set back then, and this is four or five years ago, was we wanted Wildwood to become the UK leading native species charity for rewilding. Mm. Um, and we, we've done that. Wow. that. That is where we are now. So that's, that's really exciting. And we're literally just about to sit down now with directors and staff and trustees and think, OK, in the next five years, what's that goal? What's yeah. that going to be? And we'll get everyone involved in that conversation because mm. it's, it's really important that everyone's part of that. Everyone's mm. part of what Wildwood wants to be. Mm -hmm. And we'll set our vision for the future and then we'll spend the next five years working towards that. And do you have like a personal idea of what you would like that to be like in the next sort of five, ten years? It, what we've done in the past five years is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Our conservation work, our rewilding work, our education work have all hugely expanded. Mm -hmm. We're doing really important, groundbreaking projects now with really exciting partners. Mm -hmm. And really, it's doing much more of that. Right. But now, now that our reputation is what it is, we get asked all the time about, can you help us with this project? Can you work on this project? And we actually need to be selective now in what we work on and make right. sure that we're working on the projects with partners that we can really work well with and deliver fantastic projects with and have the biggest impact with the you know the limited resources we've got as a still quite a small charity mm, absolutely and it, it must be 
I know one of the things that you've done is you've, you've traveled to places like Denmark and you, you, you to, to various places kind of sharing information and sharing knowledge. Um, could you talk a little bit about that, like what you've been doing um, sure. sort of abroad as well? Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the reasons we've been so successful in the past few years is through partnerships with other organizations. Yeah. You know, what we need to do to basically save nature, to, to restore our native species, is to do stuff on a really big scale. Mm. Um, small, we, you know, for 20 odd years, Wild Woods done fantastic conservation work, you know, capture breeding of dormice and red squirrels and water voles and, and getting them out back in the wild. But in order to do these big projects, like the bison project, like the wildcat project we're working on, like the pie martin project, you can only do those in collaboration with other people. Mm -hmm. And so we've made loads and loads of fantastic partnerships over the years, and really that's, that's the key to the future. And one of the, one of the groups we, that was set up, it, sort of from Wildwood, uh, almost on the back of the bison project, is the Large Herbivore Working Group which is a bit of a mouthful, yeah. but it's everyone across the UK who's working with large herbivores trying to rewild them. So mm. people who are working with wild boar, Exmoor ponies, bison, mm. all that sort of stuff, coming together collectively to share knowledge, to support each other, but also, and, and this is one of the things I'd really like Wildwood to do a lot more of in the future, is lobby and campaign for change to make these projects more effective and simpler and less expensive. The red tape at the minute is enormously complicated. Sure. But through that collective grouping together of people, we can actually have a far bigger impact. Yeah, strength in numbers, I guess. Absolutely. In terms of, and how, how does that sort of lo lobbying take effect? Like, what, how, how do you do that? How do you change policy within government? And I mean, a very simple example is I've got a call on Tuesday morning with the, the shadow secretary for nature in the Labour Party. Wow. And I want him and hopefully some of his team to come down to Wildwood meet us, meet people from the Large Herbal Working Group and talk about what Labour can put into their manifesto for nature mm -hmm. that will help us deliver this sort of stuff. Mm. So it's really direct, it's yeah. talking to politicians, it's having that collective voice that enables us to do it. And I guess showing them as well, like, absolutely. I mean, we've got, I mean, Wildwood Kent and Wildwood Devon is, you know, you can see the change, you know, on, on, a, on a daily and monthly basis, yeah. I guess. So. Absolutely. And, and the popularity and the positive story around the Bison Project gives us a real opportunity to do that. Mm. You know, we, we had a visit from the all-party parliamentary group for the environment to come and see the project. We had the select committee from the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Their select committee looking specifically at species reintroductions came down here and spoke to us. So mm. we're getting our voice out there in a, in a really positive and powerful way. Mm. Um, but it, you mentioned the trip to Denmark. That was a large herbivore working group trip. Mm. So we went over there and it's people from NEP, people from the Wildlife Trust and, mm -hmm. and other organisations like Lifescape Project, going over there as a group, seeing their rewilding projects on the ground, talking to the people doing it, talking to them about, again, the politics and the legislation yeah. and the practicalities of this sort of stuff. And, you know, really inspiring to see these big projects they're mm -hmm. doing and, and how their governments really embrace this in a really strong way. So Europe seems quite far ahead of us in terms of the rewilding kind of, I mean, because I've uh, been listening to loads of other podcasts in terms of like you know wolves and, and bears being reintroduced even to, all the way down to Spain and you know yeah. are they quite far ahead of us in terms of their, their policy and you know in in some areas yes in other areas no oh, okay um, so for example when we went to Denmark um, they've effectively eradicated all wild boar from oh, the wow. country okay. and they put up a wild boar proof fence across the entire German border so there are no wild boar in, Ger in Denmark okay. and other than one enclosed project no one's using wild boar in, oh, in terms okay. of rewilding because of a, a fear of disease and African swine fever right. because of the huge Danish pig industry. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's a really interesting angle when you go over there and you see that, oh yeah, we, we, you know, we just can't work with wild boar. And in the Netherlands where they've got these fantastic bison projects, mm. again, no wild boar because of fear of the um, diseases and, and pig industry. And one of the things I wanted to talk about very quickly is navigating funding challenges. Yes. That, so all of these projects, obviously, they're, they're not cheap in terms of you know, being able to, to, to get going. What, what funding challenges does, does Wildwood Trust have uh, in terms of getting these off, off the ground? Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest barriers and challenges to making these projects happening, to getting species back in the wild, is the funding. Mm. Um, up literally until last year, we'd never seen a penny of government money wow. to do any really? of this work. Wow, that's um, Last year, we were able to secure two grants from Natural England to work on the return of the chuffs. So we've got chuffs back yeah. in the wild in Kent now. Uh, and also we're working on a, a native crayfish project at our park in Devon. Mm -hmm. And they're now both funded by Natural England, yeah. which is you know, amazing and, and quite unusual. But the reality is, is generally it's really difficult to fund this stuff. 
Mm. Um, Wild has always been a very grassroots organisation. So 80% of our income comes from our, our members and our visitors. Mm. So those people who turn up here with their children and walk around the park, become members and continue to pay us, you know, that funds a huge amount of what we do. And that, that's absolutely important. It's totally key. But we're always looking for corporate sponsors and donations and you know, grant making trusts to, to, to give us awards as well. And mm. you know, we work continuously really hard to try and bring those pockets of money in that enable us to deliver these projects. Mm -hmm. you know, for example, the, the Bison project, the initial three years of funding came from the People's Postcode Lottery. And that was a very, it was a very brave project for them to take on. Mm -hmm. There's a fair amount of sort of risk and uncertainty around the first one of these in the UK. Yeah. But they were willing to take that risk and they funded the first three years and it's it's an amazing project. Yeah. Um, and we're really proud of it. They're incredibly proud that they funded that project. Um, but now that needs to become a self-sustaining, self-funding project for the next 20, 30, 40 years really. Yeah. That's, you know, these aren't short-term projects. Absolutely. The reintroduction of the Chuffs, it's a 10-year project. You know, our Wildcat project that we're working on at the moment, that's probably a 10, 15 year project as well. Mm. You know, a lot of the grants that are out there will give you three years of funding, mm. which can get you started, but yeah. it's it's very hard to find that long term funding. So, you know, memberships and things like it's that are crucial. We just get as many people through. And, and I guess that's important for education as well, because that's going to, you know, then you know as, as all of these kids who are coming through Wildwood you know grow up they're gonna have that passion to um, carry on the message and yeah, yeah. oh a a absolutely one of the you know Britain's a nature depleted country mm. and people who live here are disconnected from nature mm -hmm. you know most people don't know what our native species are when yeah. they come around Wildwood and they see things like elk and lynx and bears and wolves it's like yeah, these are our native species mm. they used to live in the wild here you know people are really blown away by it but they it gives them that ability to encounter our native species, mm. get that connection. If, if you know, people don't love nature, they won't act to save it. And Wildwood's a very inspiring place for people to come and get that connection. Yeah. And yeah, we get you know, 10,000 school kids through the wow. park in a year. And every single one of them goes away being you know, a little bit more connected to nature. If you've grown up, um, you know, where I grew up in, in, in Middlesbrough, like, you never saw a red squirrel so from my went from my upbringing i just thought that gray squirrels were native and, yeah. and you know that is you know we talked a little bit about that, about that um with laura and you know when you're trying to um make changes of introducing squirrels and um you know that that's just a an interesting sort of without the education people just see what's around them they don't understand what is what, what we've been lacking and what's been missing yeah that's yeah. absolutely right people don't realize how how much we've lost mm. Um, and you know, red squirrels is a, is a great example. And you know, if, if I want to look ahead and you know, be look at one thing that Wildwood could achieve, it's getting red squirrels back in the south of England. Yeah, uh, you know, if we can get red squirrels in the Bleen, yeah, you know, <laughs> wow. we, we've really done a, a fantastic yeah. job because you know, there's many, many steps to make that happen, mm -hmm. to get the environment right, to, to look at the red squirrels, to get pine martins back in the wild. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of steps to be taken, but if we can get red squirrels back, yeah, we, we've really started to heal nature in the south of England. Brilliant. And for people who aren't um, members of Wildwood or are kind of new to um, what we do, could you sort of explain about what, you know, what is rewilding? It's a, good, it's, it's a really good question. And it's, there's lots of different people have different okay. definitions. To me, rewilding is putting the animals back into the environment that will put the ecological processes back that are missing. Mm -hmm. The best example, I think, is the bison. Yeah. So you put the bison in the bleen, um, and areas where you used to go in and coppice the sweet chestnut every so many years, so you get the right habitat for nightingales and other species. Mm -hmm. You know, we stop doing all that work. You put the bison back in, and just by living in the bleen, by being wild animals and doing their normal behaviours, they move through that landscape and they change it. They will knock some trees down. They will create open spaces. They will dust bathe and create these big sand bowls. They're creating niches and giving the opportunity for plant species to come back, for more insects to come back, mm -hmm. that then feeds the birds and the bats and the reptiles. And you get an explosion of biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So to me, rewilding is restoring those processes. Right. And it's finding the animals that will have the biggest impact to do that, mm -hmm. that you put back that you reintroduce into that area, mm -hmm. and you get, as you said, this explosion of biodiversity. You know, mm -hmm. Beavers are another fantastic yeah, example. You, know, you put beavers into a, a wetland system, and literally yesterday I was talking to the guys who've just done the Eileen Beaver Project, mm -hmm. and they've been in for three months, and they've created this amazing wetland already. There's four dams in there, 
and an area that flooded last year, this year, didn't flood because the beavers it just are there. It's moved so fast, nature. Like, yeah. It just seems to be like an instant kind of, you know, if you just leave it, leave nature to it and we, we introduce it and give it a little helping hand, it seems to just take over and... Absolutely. And, and run with it. This little stream that the beavers are now on, for the first time in anyone's memory, they're starting to see the gravel beds appear again. Just because of the action of the beavers, the creation of the change in the flow of the water and their dams, you're exposing the gravel beds, which is where the fish need to spawn. Mm. And the complexity of the dam is a perfect spawning site for the tiny fish to go where they won't get predated. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you, you put a few beavers back in and it becomes wild and it becomes full of biodiversity and it becomes full of nature. Mm. So to me, that's, that's rewilding. That's rewilding is. And it's not trying to go back to the Pleistocene or a, a historical place where, you know, there was this, you know, idyllic nature because that, that's not possible. We live yeah. in a very human influenced landscape, particularly in this country. So what we do is we rewild it, which is make it more wild, and then it becomes something new, mm -hmm. something more dynamic, something more complicated, something that's more resilient to climate change. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've talked about what rewilding is. What, what are some of the challenges of rewilding? I mean, th there's a lot. There's, there's, there's an, a misconception about what the word means. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of politics around it, particularly in certain parts of the country. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's rewilding is, is seen as a very negative thing in Wales because of some projects that didn't talk to local people in a very effective right, way. Okay. And it's created a bit of toxicity around the word. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, the, the, the main challenge, policies and legislation that exist for the Wildlife and Countryside Act and the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, mm -hmm. none of them were designed thinking about these sorts of projects. Right. And so you're very much trying to fit a, a square peg into a round hole in terms of the regulations I guess and the laws. it's new ground, isn't it? So it is. You're kind of like creating the playbook as you, as you go along. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But there are real challenges with it. And, mm. you know, government agencies, in some cases, don't understand this sort of stuff. Mm. And so when we were trying to get a license to bring a zoo bison from Germany into the Bleen Bison Project, mm -hmm. it wasn't that anyone was being difficult, but there just yeah. was no system or process or bits of paper that lined up that would actually enable that to happen. Mm. So it took six months of work in order just to enable that animal to be moved wow. into the Bleen project. You know, it's, it's a fantastic project. It's had such enormous positive reception as well. I did an interview with the Washington Post about it. Wow. You know, it's on the South African main news at Christmas. Um, you know, an interview in The Spectator. So lots of unusual sort of press Mm. coverage that wildlife stuff doesn't usually get has, mm. has really hit it. You know, the day we put the first three bison out about 19 months ago, we were on the front page of the Times, the Independent and the Guardian, which wow. was phenomenal. It's you only 19 months ago that it started. 19 months ago. Wow. Uh, the first bison went out in, in um, July 2022. That's such a quick progression in terms of like what's been achieved and yeah, that's crazy to think it's only been 19 months since that. that no, it, it right? really is. I mean, the Bison Project is one of those projects that went from the initial conversation with Kent Wildlife Trust around a meeting in our education centre. We were talking about, you know, what projects can we work on together? Mm -hmm. We went over to the Netherlands. We saw a couple of their projects, came back massively inspired. <laughs> of I think we have to make this happen, you know, and then secured the funding really, really quickly. And that popularity and that reach and, and the receptiveness of that, surely that must say that, you know, People are people are waiting for this. People are ready for it. You know, people are really engaged with it. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, there is a huge public outcry for these sorts of projects. You know, you know, Britain, like I say, is in a nature depleted state. We're one of the worst countries in the world for our biodiversity intactness. Mm. It's, it's it's really terrible. Um, and I think the message has finally got through to people that we, you know, we really need to do something. And so to have a project where we are doing it, where we're delivering, where we're showing you can do it, even in a busy place like Kent, it's not up in the Highlands somewhere, it's right here, mm -hmm. making a huge difference for nature. It's really inspired a lot of people. And I think that public will is massively behind what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, there's huge support for this now. Um, there's even a, quite a lot of political support for it too. Brilliant. And what can we uh, get excited about in 2024 here at Wildwood Kent and Devon? Well, you know, it's... There's always a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> Mark would say it's hard to, to sort of list everything, but uh, yeah. Just... Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, in terms of the conservation projects, clearly the bison project is now up and running. Yeah. We want to launch our sort of, I don't know what we're going to call them yet, but sort of bison safari days yep, where absolutely. people will come, they'll meet bison ranger Don, who's an absolutely oh. inspirational guy. Um, 
He's going to be on the podcast for sure. Very Fantastic. Soon. Well, really done. <laughs> he, he'll give people a talk about the bison yeah. and the project and show some of his f- fantastic photography. Um, then take them out into the Bleen to sort of walk around the area, talk about the project and, and the bison, and then come back into the park, meet the bison that we've got here, um, and really get people really sort of in-depth connected to the project and understanding all the complexities and nuances of it. It's all about the biodiversity. Yeah, I mean, if there's anyone that's nearly more infectious um, than, the, um, than the bison to get people involved in conservation, it might be Don. Absolutely, yeah. No, he, 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 he's amazing. He, he's, a, he's a fantastic asset for yeah. us to have. Um, so that, that's coming, you know, hopefully in the yeah. next few months. But again, we did the first chuff reintroduction in Kent last year. Yeah. We're breeding more chuffs to go out this year. Mm-hmm. Um, we're revamping the bird show this year, so next year we should have a, a really fantastic bird show with lots of native species birds mm-hmm. that people will be able to see flying and up, up close and personal. So, you know, really exciting. There's, there's, there's so much coming. People just need to keep an eye on our social media and, yeah. and, and see as it happens. So, Paul, I know you're a very uh, busy person, um, but we have a, a final thing that we like to do where we ask you a couple of questions that's coming for some, some of our members and some of our social media followers. Sure. Um, so, give me two seconds. <laughs> and we'll just lean over here to our fantastic little tray, um, which will soon be sponsored, hopefully. Um, and if you would like to choose a question and then pass it to me, I will ask it to you and then we'll go from there. Choose them myself. Yeah. There we go. Um, yep. Thank you very much. What's one animal fact that you know that most people don't? Um, I mean, there's, a, there's about 10 fantastic ones about beavers, but I think the one that is, is really quite bizarre is our reindeer. Okay. So if you stand at our reindeer enclosure and it's quiet and you listen to them, as they're walking, you hear this little clicking noise, okay. almost like an electric fence shorting. Right. Very quiet, click, click, click as they walk around. And they've got a tendon on their rear leg that, as they walk, clicks. Oh, wow. And the, What's the use of that? <laughs> well, it's an evolutionary thing that when they're in the dark in blizzards as a big herd, they can all hear each other. Right. And so even though they can't see the, the, the reindeer around them, they can hear each other and stick together as a herd, even in the pitch black in the depths of winter in the tundra. Right, so they're using those clicks to, to make sure oh, there, there's that reindeer and know that everyone's around. Yep. Oh, wow. And, and the theory being the ones that didn't have clicky legs got lost in the, got lost in the snow and got eaten by wolves. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, let's go for another question. Fantastic, that's a great um, little fact though, I love that. What do you think is the most underrated animal here at Wildwood and why? I don't know. I, I don't know if they're underrated. I, I love all, all the animals here, but they're... You have to say that as like a parent now. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it's some of the ones that people don't see very often, I suppose. Mm. Things like the, the polecats or the badgers. You know, when we do our sort of summer evening openings, yeah. you know, it, we're open sort of six till nine during the summer. Yes. And in those sort of evening times, you quite often see the badgers out scuttling around and being fed. Right. And they are beautiful animals. They're mm. really funny sort of characters. And you see sort of tumbling around and feeding. And most of the time, because they're mostly nocturnal, during the day you're not going to see them. Or you might see them asleep inside the enclosure, curled up in a, in a ball. But right. to actually see the badgers scuttling around, I think, is, is great. Fab. Okay, let's do another question. There you go. Thank you very much. Have you ever had a memorable encounter with an animal in the wild? And what happened? The sad thing is, living in Britain, you don't get many animal encounters right. in the wild. You go through a walk through a British woodland and your chances of seeing a mammal is really small. Mm. Um, you might see a, an American grey squirrel. Um, you know, it's so unusual to see actual wildlife in English woodlands these days. Mm. Um, you know, wildwood was always created to recreate the wild wood where you've got all the species back in the woods. Mm. Um, but in terms of sort of that experience, I suppose, and it's an interesting one, it was last year I was over in Jersey talking okay. to Durrell about our wildcat project, mm. but we went up to the cliffs where they've done their chuff reintroduction, and there was a flock of around 30 wild red-billed chuffs wow. just flying around the cliff, sort of circling below us and above us, and they're incredibly acrobatic flyers, calling away to each other, then they landed on the grass on the cliffs and started foraging and feeding. And that 
was wonderful because that's what we're going to create in Kent. That's what right. we'll have on the White Cliffs of Dover and around Dover Castle is you'll get these flocks of chuff flying around just being beautiful, elegant birds. Um, yeah, so that, I suppose in the last few years that's probably the one. And I suppose the other one was in Denmark when we went to this fantastic rewilding project. It's a big fenced area mm. where they've got a herd of bison, a herd of red deer, wild boar and a wolf. Wow. Okay. And so you're standing in this landscape and we saw this herd of sort of 40 bison running through the woods, which was just spectacular to see, just hurtling through the woods, 40 massive bison. Wow. But you're in this area and there's, there's a wild wolf here. That wolf's controlling the deer population with this, this big enclosure. Mm. But there's no fear at all. Mm. You know, the, the idea that, oh no, I'm in a space with a wolf, it's dangerous. It wasn't there at all. It's just so exciting that there's a tiny chance you might get to see it. You know, obviously, we didn't see the wolf, but knowing that you're in a landscape with wolves is is really quite powerful, mm. and it's something that you know, we've lost in this country. We've not mm. had to be in a space where there are wolves or bison or, or, or large animals mm. that could potentially be dangerous, and being in that space, you respect those animals. You learn to live with them safely. You know, for example, in Yellowstone, people camp where there are bison. Yeah. And where there are bears and where there are wolves. Mm. And, you know, the only time you get a problem was when someone tries to take a selfie with one of them because they're in their space. They're not respecting the animals. Yeah. And so that we've got a long way to learn in this country about living in harmony with animals. Well, that's one of Wildwood Trust's job. Absolutely. I'm sure we'll carry on um, forging the way. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time, Paul. Really no, appreciate thanks, it. Nathan. And, um, yeah, I'm sure we'll see you in a future podcast. Fantastic. Thank, thank you very you. much. Cheers. Thank you.